welcome to the Frustrating Podcast podcast, where we break down and dissect simple podcasts and add complexity and polish. I'm your host, Elle Martinez. Today's podcast is an especially challenging one. I don't know if you heard of this show, I hope not, Stacking Benjamins, but this is a case of two people getting in way over their heads and needing serious help with polishing up their show. For this problem, they reached out to famed producer Bruce Dickerson. Let's listen in to Mr. Dickerson's advice. Hey, fellas, I'm Bruce Dickerson. Yes, the Bruce Dickerson. You have a dynamite sound, fantastic sound. I have only one suggestion. More cowbell. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and ever hear that phrase, don't be a loser? Well, you're going to change your mind about that phrase because on today's show, Mary Pillon just so happens to have put together a collection of stories on the value of losing. And today, we'll talk about the value of failure, plus which broker's losing when it comes to government intervention. We'll name names and share why tech support on your investment account may be more important than you think. And finally, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Matt from Ohio, who's attending the worst college, probably ever, who has questions about investing while in college. What should he do? other than change colleges and the show wouldn't be complete without some of my presidential trivia and now two guys who i can now confirm are definitely not on my vp short list a vp choice that i'm announcing live today hashtag doug 2020 it's joe and oh j-j-j-j-g oh it's finally the day the monumental day here in the basement. Happy Monday, everybody, and happy Doug's VP Pick Monday. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, the guy helping me with the introductory segments leading up to the big VP Pick, it's Mr. OG. What's happening? Is it going to be me, do you think? Well, he just said it's not going to be you. Oh. He, he already said you I and I I don't listen to anything he says. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad how you tune in when I say the letters OG, and then we're off and running. Hey, big show today. Mary Pallon here with us, of course. She wrote the book on Monopoly a few years ago that we talked about, how that game was made. She is back with a collection of stories on losers, and we always hear these great stories about what it's like to win the championship, but let's be honest. When do you actually learn more, OG? Uh, I know the answer is when I lose the championship, but however, you've never lost anything. So <laughs> but I don't, I'm not a loser. <laughs> hey, if you want money lessons on the go and to surround yourself with like-minded people, head to the Stacky Benjamin's money club. This is a great place to get a foundation about money. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash money club for more on that. Great show today. Mary Pallon coming to the basement, but first we have some headlines. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our first headline comes to us from investmentnews.com. Robinhood's rapid rise yields irate traders' U.S. probes. Oh, boy. Remember that other shoe we thought might drop with Robinhood? Never thought it would. (laughs) I was pretty sure that this thing was pretty much on the up and up the entire time. Both the Securities and Exchange Commission and FINRA now investigating Robinhood's handling of its March outage, sources say. Robinhood Markets has capulted ahead of its online broker rivals with a smartphone app that's attracted an army of young investors. Yet with the company's rise has come a litany of problems, trading outages, angry customers, and regulatory probes. By the way, I brought up just how bad Robinhood treats its customers, a piece that you forwarded to me. I brought it up in the basement. I don't know if you saw this discussion, but the discussion was was sort of frustrating. There were a number of people who answered with a collective, eh, I think I'll keep using them. 
It's okay. Yeah. They lied to me four times. Thank you. It's okay. Well, and a couple of weeks ago, that didn't make this news story because this is what they're talking about from March when the app shut down. The thing that happened a couple of weeks ago, you may remember Apple and Tesla split a few Mondays ago before Labor Day. And uh, for the better part of half the day, Robinhood was reporting the correct number of, or the incorrect number of shares, but the correct price. So if you were not knowing what was going on, you logged in and saw that your stock was down 70% or something like that. Well, this is what's funny. With no way to deal with it because there was, you know, they had all the outages and stuff. One person defending Robinhood said, hey, they're a new company. Why don't you give them a break? I, if no, if I not. were buying... They've been around for 10 years. <laughs> what, Robinhood? Yeah, it started in like 2011 or something. Really? I think Robin has been around just a couple of years. Okay, we can play this game. What was Robin Hood established? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, April 18th, 2013. Wow. I was off by two years. My bad. But by uh, definition, you were also off by two years when you said just a few years. So, <laughs> so we're both right. In the spirit of politics, let's just assume that we're both right. Seven. Uh, but yeah, they've been around a while. Seven years. But this is also your money. I can't take that. Uh, y- you know, if it were a company making something not super important, but what, whatever company it is, you want it to be good. You want well, them to take care the, of you. Yeah, think about the outrage that happens when Wells Fargo does something below board. Yeah. <laughs> Wells Fargo, they're terrible. And then other companies do just as equally shady business and people are like, eh, you know, yeah, I mean, what is- would you do if you logged into like your bank of America account today? And it just said, sorry, not working. Sorry. No transfers allowed. Sorry. No. Yeah. No, you can't get any cash. Give them today. A break. They've only been around for a hundred hey, years. You know, Who I mean, cares? it's in tech. Yeah. It's, it's going to be okay. Tech. Oh, be they're fine. They're a fine they company. Out. Stop Don't getting crazy. all angry at them. Yeah. The person even said that uh, they thought that I had had some personal problem with them because of how angry I seemed. I'm like, I'm not angry. Yeah, those, those long I don't even, I don't Tesla calls use... really backfired on you. <laughs> I don't even use Robin Hood. You know why? Because I do a little homework first. I don't just buy the catchy name. Over the first half of the year, U.S. consumer protection agencies received more than 400 complaints about Robin Hood, roughly four times more than competitors like Charles Schwab and Fidelity Investments Brokerage Unit. The grievances obtained via public records request to the Federal Trade Commission depict novice investors in over their heads struggling to understand why they've lost money on stock options, why well, Robinhood gives well, that's, novice investors stock options anyway. Is that the tool or the user? I kind of think at this point the users are the tools. Nice. Is that is that harsh? Among the setbacks highlighted in the documents is a pivotal breakdown in early March when Robinhood stopped working for more than a day. Remember that? Just as markets were swinging wildly on coronavirus fears. Some complainants reported losing thousands of dollars because they couldn't sell holdings. Others bemoaned the missed opportunity to profit. Most disturbing to the investor was that as the chaos reigned, there was nobody at Robinhood to call for assistance. Many couldn't even find a phone number. It just says to submit an email. One investor in Atlanta fumed after spending a week trying to get help from the firm's customer service department. Company's negligence cost me $6,000. Another from North Dartmouth, Massachusetts, who estimated losing $20,000. Couldn't reach a live person to close an account. I can't make trades, can't take my own money, and can't leave their service. A company spokesman said Robinhood takes seriously its responsibilities to clients, especially when so many investors are making their initial forays into trading. Though the firm doesn't disclose exact figures, it's doubled its customer service representatives this year and is hiring hundreds more, he said. In fact, our friend Matt in our Facebook group published a listing for people that uh, might have a good job opportunity ahead of the emoji. Especially if you're tolerably decent at handling problems. <laughs> I just think when it comes to something as important as your money, I only have so many things I can think about. I don't want to have to think about my platform. I don't want to think about yeah. where my research is coming from. I just want to know that I have them. And clearly Schwab and Fidelity aren't angels. I mean, a hundred each compared to Robin Hood's 400. They still had a hundred. They still have people complaining well, have, about them. You know, way more clients too. But I think if you approach it from the perspective of what it really should be, Robin Hood is like DraftKings, Good just point. for money. Sometimes you get lucky and it works out right, and sometimes you don't get lucky and it doesn't work out right. It it should not be a location for long term investing. It should not be a location for your financial independence money. Not because it's bad or good, but it's not designed for that. 
your long-term investment money should be in a place that you don't trade should be in a place that, well, maybe, maybe it is designed for that if you can't trade in Robinhood, but no, I mean, you know, <laughs> keep it separate. If you want to have a Robinhood account and you want to screw around with it, no problem, but just, you, you know what you're getting, you know, it just yeah. is what it is. So be okay with it. Our second headline comes to us from Napa net. That's the national association of plan advisors. It's written by Ted Godbout. I saw this study and I'm glad that Ted was able to look over it because I can't wait to dive into this study that Ted talks about from Morningstar. Uh, He writes that estimating the length of retirement is one of the most important aspects in financial planning, yet many investors underestimate their average lifespan, which can have a detrimental effect on their ability to retire successfully, according to new research. Morningstar Investment Management's Estimating the End of Retirement explores various factors relating to how to estimate the end of retirement in a financial plan using data from the Health and Retirement Study and the Survey of Consumer Finances. While there's an expansive amount of literature examining objective mortality factors, the study notes that there's no consensus approach to estimating the length of retirement. Moreover, it's not clear to what extent subjective estimates are reliable and how and if objective factors are correctly considered, the paper emphasizes. This idea of knowing when you're going to die, man, does that, that... Boy, that would make things easier. Make things so, so much. Just tell me the day and I will plan everything around that. Well, most people look at life expectancy through the eyes of the generations before them. So, you know, they say, well, grandma and grandpa lived to be in their 70s. And you hear this just in the language that people use. Oh, well, the men in my family die young. The women in my family live long, you know, or whatever it is. And the reality is, is that when grandma and grandpa were born, life expectancy was 40 or 50. And now the average life expectancy is closer to 80 for most people. I think you've got to really strongly consider, you know, having your financial plans go at least until 100. I think in the very near future, over the next four or five years, we'll probably be increasing them to 110 in terms of a planning perspective, only because the penalty for being wrong on the other side is enormous. You don't want to be 96 and be like, well, I planned on dying at 95, so I'm out. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, that's, it that's, seems that's like no in a good financial plan, just like we plan for the worst and hope for the best, in this case, don't get me wrong, it'd be great to live for a long time, but the worst case for your money is that you live for a long time. So instead of saying that you're going to die at 85, why wouldn't you use a later date? Well, because if it's just one of those variables that you can change that make the penalty for not being up to date on your, on your planning at 55 that much more attainable. You know, if you're staring down retirement and you're 55 years old and you're like, well, the good news is I think I'm going to die by 80. So I really only need 15 years worth of this stuff. You know, I can retire by 65. And, and you're, you're laughing, but that's people do think of it that way. Sure. And Martha, we can make it after yeah. 80. We're not going to be able to taste anything anyway. Yeah, so we cares? could just live on fancy feast. We're going, to, we're going to live with the kids. But the other side of that is that if you do plan on this, 35-year retirement, this 40-year retirement, and you're forgoing things early on because you've got this longevity problem, that's not fun for retirement either. Because you don't want to be just sitting on your, you know, sitting on your hands and then go, oh, well, good thing I saved all this money and I died when I was 79. So, so I've got all this cash and I never did anything. I think the key is to develop a lifetime portfolio that's income sustaining so that regardless of how long that income is, is needed, your portfolio is able to kick that off. But the downside of that, that I mean, but there is a downside of that. The downside is, is that you always have to have amount of assets to be able to do that. Right. Instead of, you know, doing what Bill Perkins said a few weeks ago and dying with zero, it's very hard to put your last quarter in the coat machine and clutch your chest if you're creating this sustaining sustaining problem yep it is but the outcomes are much better so they are much better well and imagine too you know i mean i'm kind of joking about what bill said when he was on about dying with zero but seriously when you see people on the way to zero like you and i have those last five years when the portfolio is just the spending's out of control, they're not making any moves to change it. 
life is really difficult, the anxiety I see that people have and the yeah. frustration that they have is through the wall. And then the um, inevitable depression that, that sets in during that particular time, because you know that you are running out, you know, that there's, there's just no great way. Well, I think it's a strong case for making sure that you attack this issue early by saving and investing, even if it's just little sums, you know, sometimes get people get stressed out about the, you know, this, uh, this financial independence thing. And it's like, Oh, I've got to max out this and I've got to save. That's the top of the mountain. You know, if you can put a hundred dollars away or $50 away or $200 away or $500 away today, that pays so much more dividends in terms of the flexibility down the line. You know, if you're looking at being in your fifties and going, well, I've got a plan on dying a little early because I didn't take care of stuff the first 30 years of my working career. That just makes it that much more, uh, like you said, stressful. So the key is flexibility along the way. This is part of the reason, by the way, we had the episode with uh, Vicki Robin replay during our off week, because this whole idea, OG, of intentional spending, you know, spend lavishly on things that you really want, but then cut ruthlessly on things that you don't care about is really an important part of the plan so that you can put that money away, but not have it affect your lifestyle today. I mean, that was Bill Perkins' real point was that you don't want to miss out on today, but to get everything you want today, I think you've got to cut out all those things. I think you got to be a lot more intentional. My problem is, is that I have a long list of wants. <laughs> the things that you absolutely love. So I, so I have many things that I want to spend lavishly on. Very few things I don't. I love my cake recipes of the month club. I have to continue, exactly. even though the last three years of those are, are just hanging out there. But someday, someday OG is going to make a cake. I think that's takeaway number one, isn't it? Someday OG will make a cake. I think the best way to have your cake and eat it too. Bam. Winning. You're welcome, America best segue ever would be to be intentional about your spending today and put money away. And, and by the way, look at how long you're going to live, bet on living a long time. Don't bet on living just for a short time. And then I think our second takeaway is the brokerage platform you use probably matters. You want it to be there when you're ready to make a financial move. It's one less thing that you need to think about. Spend your time thinking about the big things and not whether your broker's all frozen up. Well, Mary Pallon has always been one of my favorite people to talk to. She is a journalist, author, and screenwriter focused mostly on the world of sports and business. She has uh, been a staff writer with The Times and at The Wall Street Journal. She's covered all kinds of world of business and finance. And this is why I like Mary as a sports writer, as a guy that appreciates sports. And I think even for people who don't appreciate sports, the way that she can meld sports into our everyday life is important. Of course, last time we talked to us for The Monopolist, the story of how the board game Monopoly was created, which was... Uh, fantastic discussion. We'll also have Richie, our producer, link to that in the show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Today, we're not talking about that today. Today, we're talking about losers. We always hear those stories about people winning and how great it is to reach the top of the mountain. But what, oh gee, if you climb the entire mountain, but you don't reach the top. Mary Pallon, coming down to the basement. And joining us on my dad's shortwave radio, it's our friend, Mary Pallon. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, I love following your career, Mary, because even though you write about sports, the last time we talked to you was about Monopoly. And then you wrote The Kevin Show, which is a lot like this guy living in his own Truman Show universe. And now I'm surprised when I find out that you and another woman are editing and putting together an anthology of essays about <laughs> losers. Yeah. Why this project and why you and why now? Uh, Luisa and I both had been laid off from sports writing gigs and we worked together. We'd admired each other's works. We were, we were friends and we were just talking about, you know, various stories that we wanted to do, the types of stories we were drawn to. And uh, we were having coffee and I was like, you know, what about losers? Like, I love stories about losers. I think that we have this kind of pro winner bias 
in our coverage. And obviously, yes, it's a big deal when you win, you know, whether it's an Olympic gold medal or an NBA final or what have you. But we noticed that there was this taboo around losing and losing is a fact of life, losing loss, whether it's the loss of a loved one, the end of a relationship, losing in sports. Both of us played sports as kids. And that was really intriguing to us. We were like, most people, especially at something like the Olympics, like most people lose. Yet it's this thing that we're not supposed to talk about. We're not supposed to write about. And we kind of were kicking around this idea of like, we love essay collections. And we sent around an email to, um, you know, people like our dream team, who would we love to contribute? And the responses we got were amazing. This is before we even pitched the book. And we were like, we have to do this because um, it was a mix of just dream authors and people that we love and athletes. And we realized we hit a vein and the same way people will rip apart a win and analyze every single move, every single play, what made it go that way. We thought that losing similarly was just as complex and nuanced. So we dove in. I think it might even be more complex and nuanced than winning. Like, I feel like as I was reading through these essays, I felt like I've learned so much more, Mary, in my life when I've lost than I did when I won. Like when I won, I just wanted to maintain that thing. Right. But when I lose, I come up with a five point action plan to make that not happen again. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's funny because I covered business in Wall Street before I covered sports. And in that world, you're talking about loss of money, loss of jobs. Like that was a big through line of the reporting I was doing then. And to me, there's all sorts of spar you know parallels with sports and there's a bad sports metaphor for everything. And the same way, you know, sports when you lose a really good athlete will deconstruct that loss and think about what happened, what, why did it happen? What could have happened? And we write in the introduction about how books about losing or stories about losing are also kind of ghost stories. There's this sense of what could have been what, and it hangs around. And I don't know if you watched the last dance, um, the Michael Jordan ESPN docuseries. And one of the things that Luis and I were joking about is like to us, like there's a big loser story there, right? That as much as it's about Michael Jordan's focus and his drive, it's also about his fear of losing and how that motivates him. And I think he's a great example of somebody who takes that and can harness it himself, but then also rally his team around it. Like all those sequences where you talk, you know, you see the Chicago Bulls and the, the Detroit Pistons and how he really reverse engineers that. And what I think is brilliant about that series is they get access to this part of his brain and, and this, um, you know, this footage and things that really paints that picture. So you don't think uh, we have a great piece in the collection about um, LeBron James. At first, when Luisa was like, oh, you know, Ryan wants to, Ryan or Hamlin wants to write about Le LeBron James. I was like, we don't need a LeBron piece. That's what I was thinking. Loser. When I first picked it up, Mary, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, how does LeBron James figure into a book about losing? Exactly, exactly. But Ryan pulls it off, you know, and I think that the, the Jordan LeBron parallel kind of carries over here that in some ways their careers are also loser stories. It's about a fear of loss and how they can dig into that too. That's the irony, right? That a book about losers can also be about winning and what motivates people. And sometimes like some people are at peace with their losing, you know, some people are okay with how things worked out and the best things, you know, when, when they lose a sporting event or what have you, it can be a really, really good thing. And we also wanted to zoom out a little bit, right? We have a piece about Wimbledon, a team, what happens when your team leaves the loss of the team itself, which is so unusual in European soccer happens in American sports all the time. It's very unusual. So we wanted to think about it more broadly than just, oh, you lose a game. Although we do have those as well. <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, let's dive into some of these stories because as you're talking and you're talking about all the lessons that we get from losing, I was very curious by the very first piece in the book. And clearly there's a reason why you must have started with the story. It's an essay by Charles Bach called The Sporting House. But this character, Lloyd, well, first of all, do you mind telling people a little bit of the story that Charles tells here about Lloyd and about the sporting house? Sure. So I love this piece for a variety of reasons, including that, you know, Las Vegas itself is a character. This is very much a story about Las Vegas and where better to open a collection about losing than in Sin City. So Charles writes about this Lloyd, who, you know, Sweet Peas is his name, and he's this basketball player who's incredibly talented he shares this practice facility with him. And this is back in 1986. So like thinking about like eighties era of Vegas as a sports town is like this very interesting description. And I, I didn't know much about Lloyd before we put this piece in, but it's kind of this tragic story of him as a player and what could have been, but also, you know, Charles and his relationship to basketball and kind of following Lloyd's career as it goes on this journey. And so it's these two lives that seem very 
unlinked, but then do become kind of linked together against this backdrop of Las Vegas. There's this documentary they make about him that premieres like all these years later called The Legend of Sweet Pea, which I highly recommend you see. And him looking back on on Lloyd and what you know, this kind of, again, it's a ghost story of like Lloyd's career. So I'm doing a bad job of paraphrasing this. You should just read it, but it's called <laughs> the sporting house. because That's the place where they had played together. So I just love that there's, you know, in screenwriting, you talk about foil characters, right? And so I feel like Charles does a great job of setting up his life and Lloyd's kind of as these foils of each other and following his career as it goes. Yeah. Lloyd, Lloyd is a guy who goes to play for UNLV. He's had a broken career, even through high school had a broken career. He gets to college. He ends up uh, being arrested in a raid, I believe, buying crack. And then he bounces around to all kinds of different places. And and it's really funny because we talk about learning so much from losing. I don't get the feeling that Lloyd ever really learns from his losing. Like Lloyd continues to to drift and can never get it together. In fact, there's a great quote in that story that Lloyd is running from Lloyd to Lloyd, which I found incredibly powerful. Right. And I think that there's also something about watching that that can be really difficult as a fan or a friend. And the idea that you can't you can't control what other people are going to do and what they're not going to do. And the piece I have, which is called Tomato Can Blues, is about this mixed martial arts fighter named Charles Rowan, who similarly doesn't seem to be able to learn from his losses in and out of the cage of MMA fighting, so much so that at one point he fakes his own death to try and get out of a con that's run amok. So we do have some like repetitive losing stories in here too. And you know what? The other thing about Charles's piece is like, Maybe this is just me, but like, I kind of like Lloyd. Like I kind of have this, there was something to me that really drew me in. He does such a good job of painting him as like, you know, a guy that you're rooting for. It's not just an underdog story, which is like such a cliche of sports reporting, but it's also this story about this guy that you're still like, you're still pulling for, you know, or at least I am. Yeah. Jerry Tarkanian even gives him another shot when he goes to coach for the Spurs. He brings Lloyd up. And at this point in Lloyd's life, Lloyd has failed everywhere. He's been shot three times talk about ghosts he's nowhere near the great athlete he had been and yet Tarkanian likes him so much he gives him another shot I I actually felt like just as you're talking I'm getting this aha Mary that the lessons are really on on Charles end and on my end is the reader like I'm learning from Lloyd even though Lloyd can't learn from Lloyd yeah and I think that there's also this trope that we had to be careful of of like the washed up athlete profile, sure. right? Like that's kind of a, and I think again, Charles does such a good job of executing this story and like elevating it above that to make it about, you know, generally what a second chances mean in life, right? When do we get them? How do we get them? And kind of one of the, the threads through the whole collection that we didn't, or at least I didn't really realize until we were done is like the whole idea of luck and serendipity and that in sports, one of the things I think makes sports so captivating to watch and to cover is like, yes, there's skill and there's control. And the truth about most athletes up close is they're extremely type A and there's a ton of discipline or at least a lot of athletes. But then there's also just weird stuff and weird timing and serendipity and who gives you another shot and what do you do with it? And it's interesting, you know, when we we pitched this book, it was in a different planet. We had no idea we would be releasing it in a world in which like think about the Olympians training for this summer, right? That's a once in every four year cycle if you're a gymnast, which is an extremely punishing age breakdown, like bad luck, right? If you're an athlete who's injured, this is maybe one of the best things that's happened to you. You have more time to rehab. So again, you have luck playing this huge role in who decides who wins and loses. Well, and I'm even thinking, because I do want to share with our listeners, a couple of the stories that are in here and dive in a little bit. You, you point directly to the second story in, in the book, which is uh, Bob Sullivan writes this fantastic piece about this guy who ends up being a replacement player. The baseball goes on strike in the 1990s. And you can feel that Bob really wants this guy, Frank, to succeed. And I feel like luck, Mary, plays such a role in baseball, especially. Like there's so many times when good players don't make it and bad players sometimes do. And Bob, as, as the author of this piece, reminds himself, this is a business. It's not just, you know, people do things for very weird reasons. Right. So, I mean, the common trope about baseball is it's a loser sport by definition, right? <laughs> so we we kind of in our heads, like Luis and I both love baseball, but we knew we had to have a moratorium on how many baseball pieces. So we were very selective. Um, and Bob's piece is fantastic because I think we all know about the baseball strike. I think people who know about the baseball strike, obviously it was a loss for the athletes who were playing. Obviously it was a loss for fans. 
If you're a real baseball nerd, you know about the really unlikely role that Sonia Sotomayor had in, in, you know, ending the strike long before she was a Supreme Court justice. So he has this, you know, guy he played with, Frank Euphemia, who um, is just about to get called up for the Yankees as a result of the strike. And then when the strike ends, he loses. So it's like this total inverse of how you think about the baseball strike. The idea that for Frank, this would have been a huge moment and not just to play, but to play for the Yankees. And if you're a kid from New Jersey, you know, that's like extra, extra special. And I love how Bob has this personal connection to it, right? Like I've known Bob Sullivan for years. He's an amazing journalist. He was at MSNBC for a long time. He writes all these great books. I had no idea that he played baseball at this level. I love that with, you know, he finds out where Frank is today and finds out that he has this great role coaching and mentoring younger players. So, you know, in the end, it didn't work out with the Yankees, but he has found this sense of purpose in the sport. Um, so you could argue that it's like a losing winning story, right? Yeah. That in the end out for him. So it's a little more complex than just, oh, he missed his shot. Well, and I like those two stories to kick off the book too, because you can really juxtapose Lloyd's life with Frank's life. And I feel like where Frank maybe has moved on and has used it as a stepping stone to some degree, Lloyd maybe hasn't. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the other pieces in here, kind of on that note that I love is um, from Jeremy Taiwo and Steph Lowe. So Jeremy Taiwo um, is a decathlete. And the headline of the piece is, uh, actually, I'll just read it so I can get it right. Chasing Ashton Eden, an unintended pursuit of the world's greatest athlete that no one has heard of. I've seen Jeremy compete at the track trials and at the Olympics. And the decathlon is this event that is, it, it's an insane athletic feat, right? Brutal. You know, it's everything in track and field. And so Jeremy and Ashton are coming up in this sport at the same time. And Ashton Eaton's a world goes on to win two Olympic gold medals in it and set a world record. And they're both in the Northwest. They're both, they both have all these similarities. And Jeremy's like, why am I chasing this thing? This like very narrow thing. And not only that, Ashton's like a really good guy. So he's not just like beating up. He's like, a really nice person and how that makes it like almost worse. But Jeremy realizes that, you know, it's also about his relationship with his father and his father immigrating to the United States and his father's history as an Olympian and what it meant for Jeremy to become a member of the U S Olympic team, you know, for his father who had immigrated from another country and competed. And so I love these stories that started out as one thing, you know, and I think Bob's piece does this too. It's, I want this one narrow thing and it ends up becoming about something bigger than what the stated goal was. And I think for me, as somebody who had a pretty, uh, losing was a hallmark of my youth sports career. Um, <laughs> I, I think one thing that blows me away about sports is how narrow the achievement model can be, right? Like, you know, in journalism, there's a million and one ways you can find success. You can do it through books, you can do it through newspapers or magazines or podcasting. You know, it's not as narrow as once every four years, we're going to line you up and we're going to say one, two, and three. And that's it. It's it's that cut and dry and that brutal. So I think with these, a lot of these pieces are about, or, you know, obviously in the pros, whether we're talking about the NFL or baseball, like there's a similarly narrow metric for what success is. It's the Super Bowl or it's the World Series. And I love that in this collection, we have people kind of parsing through that. And like, what does that do to people psychologically and mentally when the thing that our society has decided in sports is successful so narrow and uh, you know, I think Jeremy and Frank are great examples of people who go, they transcend beyond that, right? And they find out it's not about the gold medal or putting on the Yankees uniform, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, and, and I do. I start wondering what these people are chasing. I mean, I think about, uh, and I want to ask you about Sir Arthur Cunan Doyle being in this book, known for Sherlock Holmes, but somehow you include him in a thing about the marathon. But as I'm reading that, you know, the, you feel the pain of this Italian runner who's running or to your point, a guy chasing the decathlon of all things. I've helped friends do ultra marathons, these hundred mile races. And generally they're allowed to have a pacer for the last half. And, and I'll run 20 to 25 miles with some of these people. And at this point, late in the race, Mary, they barely know their name. They're stumbling along. They can't remember anything that their, their mental capacity has been reduced. And I just think, and I found this in story after story that you have here. I just find myself thinking, is all this pain worth it? Right. Is it really worth it to go on this chase? When to your point, once every four years or once, you know, it's, it's going to be this cut and dried and there's a huge chance that I'm never going to win in this endeavor. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a big distance running nut and marathoner myself. And I know exactly what you're talking about when there comes a point in the race for me, it's more in the middle, actually at the end, at the end, I feel like I can see the light of the tunnel where I'm like, what am I doing? I just get so angry. It's a good thing. I'm not talking to anybody. Right. And like, 
you know, and it's funny the, the I ran the New York marathon last year and it's virtual this year. And I thought, you know, and sometimes the training runs are worse because you don't have someone handing you Gatorade. You don't have people cheering for you. Yeah. Like, and, and New York is such a great fun event that I was like, I don't know if I have a virtual race in me. Like, I don't know if that's like, you know, God bless the people doing it. And I will be virtually cheering, but like the dynamic changes. And so we found this piece by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's about the 1908 Olympic marathon. And what I love about it is first of all, that like Sherlock Holmes author had like a sports writing career is a thing that is lost on a lot of people. So much of the, of what you're talking about, just the senselessness and the brutality of marathoning was as true then a century ago, people trying to cheat, the, the fans not be able to turn away, kind of the masochism of it holds true there and just the way I can't do it justice but like the language that he uses and the grandiosity of it is so fun to read about and it's still brutal it's still brutal and tennis you know Lisa Thomas has a great piece about Nick Kyrgios like uh, which I'm sure I didn't say correctly that there's something about when you watch these things especially in person whether it's running or tennis or whatever that you just you feel it in a different way and you you can feel for me it's my stomach I can feel my stomach just like you know like sucking in and I don't know I think running which is a sport that I you know deeply love it's so raw in running right you can't get lost in the rules or the this or that it's the definition of the sport is so narrow which is like get to the finish line as fast as you can and you know, the ultras take that to another level. Uh, maybe in our sequel, even more losers or whatever we're going to call it. We have an <laughs> ultra piece in because I've crossed a marathon finish line and just had this thought of like, oh God, I'm so glad that's it. The idea of doing more than 26.2 is like, whew, it's a special, special kind of hell. Well, it's funny. I've always joked that if I ever get caught running 26.3, something went hella wrong. Like just right. completely, right. no thanks. I don't want to go further than that. But as a creator, how the hell did you find that piece? There's got to be a story there about all of a sudden you realize that uh, this guy known for something completely different, Sherlock Holmes, all of a sudden, I'm just imagining the day when this either falls in you, your lap or you discover it. Well, that was on the Public Domain Review, which is this fantastic website that is exactly what it sounds like. They find these gems in the public domain. I have to go through my emails and find out who found it first, or I remember loosely thinking like that marathon, if you're a running history nerd is like a known thing because sure. of the cheating piece of it. And it led to a lot of debates about what is cheating and what is it, which now a century later, I argue is kind of coming up with the whole Nike vapor fly debate, right? Like right. cheating is like an endless conversation in sports, particularly in running. So somehow it was clinking around, but we also, before we pitched this, I, and I think this is important for any book that you're trying to do. We did a lot of research on what had been done. We were like, surely somebody has done a collection on losers. Surely someone has. And I, I can't remember totally, but I feel like we did a lot of vetting ahead of time to see. And, you know, obviously the answer was no, which is a sign that we were supposed to go do it. And we did. But I can't remember if it came up in that early stage or where. But immediately when we found it loose and everything, we have to put this in. Like, we have to find a way to get it in. So I, I can't remember exactly how that came about. But it to us was like, and we, we consider like Gay Talese, like the patron saint of losing sports. Like he is, so we were thrilled to get a Floyd Patterson piece in. He's had a few incredible losing stories. So we wanted to get some history things in there too. So yeah. yeah. And I, you know, to be honest, I haven't reread any Sherlock Holmes stuff since this essay collection has come out, but I'd be curious. I think I'm going to read it more differently. I feel like he's now be, been rebranded in my head as like a sports reporter who happened to have some detective <laughs> flair. Mike. I think that's great. You can do the rebranding. Uh, by the way, you can't remember, but you need to just make up a better story than that. Just make up one. Like come know, up with something I know, that's. I know. I had a dream about my, you know. There you go. And what have you. And I have never edited an essay collection before. I've written books. But part of the joy, I used to have editors say this all the time, like, oh, we'll let you tell it. And now I get that. I'm like, just go read it. You know, I'm not going to be able to do better describing Doyle than Doyle. Like, just go read it. I now have this new respect and appreciation for editing. Um, and when you just like want to like, you know, shove things off yeah. because you believe much in the work that you've, <laughs> you've, you know, helped carry. The book is called Losers Dispatches from the Other Side of the Scoreboard, edited by both you and Louisa Thomas, obviously available everywhere. Yes. And just a shout out to Bookshop. I think right now a lot of folks are asking how they can support local bookstores. And Bookshop is this amazing website where you can order. I've been doing this as gifts for people and your local bookstore fulfills it and they ship it to you and it's awesome. So I think they've just been doing a great job of getting people books safely at a time when we have, it's always a great time to read, but it's an exceptionally great time 
to read now. And there's so few sports to watch that <laughs> we, we've got your content, you know, gap filled. We, we knew somehow prophetically. Why not? Well, thanks for hanging out and talking about losing with us, Mary. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Hey, trivia fans, I'm your 2020 presidential favorite, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And if you haven't heard of my candidacy, it's because I'm letting these two other candidates battle it out in the limelight until everyone's exhausted with them both. I think we're almost there, don't you? It's strategery, people. You know, last week, you heard right here details about our absolutely stellar convention. Both of our delegates left the basement completely certain that I am not only the favorite for the presidential race in November, but I will most certainly be the best president this country has ever known. We just have one nagging issue, the peace de resistance, if you will, and that's the intrigue swirling around the fact that I haven't selected a running mate. You can feel the dramatic tension, can't you? While I'm confident that I can do the job on my own, I think this is the year I use my VP pick to send a clear message. Well, yeah, you might be delighted to know that I've made my pick and I'm ready with the big announcement right after the press arrives and after I ask you today's trivia question. The question is this, big money has always entered into political races, but in one political race, some really big money was involved. Which 20th century president had a member of the ultra-wealthy Rockefeller family as a VP? I'll be back with your answer faster than I'm sure to be sworn in. The following is an actor, not a real person. We tried to find an actual Stacking Benjamins podcast listener, but we're not sure any exist. Yesterday, I turned on one of those other podcasts... Ugh, more money talk? The topic was something called long-term care, and they couldn't even make me care for the short term. That podcast made me feel like just another number. Hi, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, the huge star of the award-winning Stacking Benjamin Show. Are you tired of podcasts that blabber on about money? Are you confused about all this IRA, SEPP, 72T, and fiduciary talk? At Stacking Benjamins, you're not just another number to us. Heck, if you actually listen, you're the only number. That's why we barely ever talk about money. Better yet, we treat you like family. We'll invite you on down to Joe's mom's basement, serve you some pie and maybe even a little lemonade. And best yet, when you leave, we'll complain about you behind your back. Because that's what real family moments are all about. I'm never going back to that old podcast. Stacking Benjamins is a way for me to avoid numbers and feel that warm, fuzzy feeling I get every time I scream at my sister on the phone. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number. Your family. Hey, trivia fans, it's your future White House insider, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm ready to announce my pick for VP. So, it, it turns out there is this really cool show on Disney Plus right now. Uh, you probably haven't heard of it. it. It's kind of a little niche thing called Hamilton. Uh, it's about this little known dude named Alexander, and I, I think he would have made an absolutely amazing VP pick by the sound of him. But not to spoil anything for you if you haven't seen it yet, it turns out that he got shot in a duel. Uh, anyway, I thought that me being so progressive that the pick was obvious. So, on this day, I am here to declare my pick for the woman who stood by his side during all of those tumultuous times, someone who's shown both bravery and the ability to work through a big scandal, because I'm probably going to have a few, say hello to my vice presidential pick, Eliza Hamilton. She's perfect. Not only is she a great singer and dancer, but she stood by Alexander's side even when he was a chump. And who doesn't love someone who takes care of orphans? If I wasn't a shoe-in already, I sure am now. 
And now that my VP pick is settled, let's get back to today's trivia. Question was, which 20th century president had a Rockefeller for VP? Well, that VP was none other than Nelson Rockefeller, who served with the 38th president of the Union, Mr. Gerald Ford, from 1974 to 1977. Okay, everyone, time to call Eliza and give her the good news. Now it's time for me to take my shot, because you know what? Shooter's going to shoot. See ya. Congratulations to Eliza Hamilton for being the big pick. Once again, I'm not sure this is going to go the way that Doug uh, thinks it's going to go. Doesn't seem like it, right? No. Also, thanks to Mary Pallon for joining us. I think she's correct, OG. I think that when we lose... We learn so much from our losses and an interesting thing. And remember this, when we were talking about midlife crises a few weeks ago, that a midlife crisis is more likely to happen when you're just focused on a goal. You're not focused on the journey getting there. You're focused on the goal. And when you reach that goal, whether you reach it or not, it's all fleeting, right? the loss actually probably stays with you longer than the win does because the second you win, you go, okay, what's the next mountain? Is there another one? The second you lose, you come up with strategies to improve yourself to maybe not have that happen again. I find this idea of losing maybe being more important than winning, uh, at least from what we take from it and how we learn from it and how we develop from it as super important stuff. In fact, you look at most of your favorite entrepreneurs that people call overnight successes, you look at the number of steps it took the vast majority of them to get where they are. A lot of losses around that, along that road to quote winning. I was going to say, we never like the ESPN stories that are like to use the sports analogies more, but we never like the ESPN stories. We're like, it's like at six, he was really good. And then never was bad and was an amazing pitcher and never, never had an issue. And what we like is the and then he tore his ankle and had blood on his sock and he still managed to do it. Or right. after breaking both legs, he conquered the Tour de France or like, you know, whatever. Those are the stories that we prefer because determination is, you know, I think a better outcome than just getting it handed to you. Well, and I think, I don't know about you, but in my daily workouts, which are a big part of uh, just doing a good job you're at so work. Your, your daily workouts, is that what you said? Yes. Nice flex. Sure. In my my every six, just hold on a second. I got to do some push ups. I'll be back to finish this segment. Exactly. We do need a pull up bar down here in the basement so I can show you how I can do like half a pull up. <laughs> a pull up bar. But on those workouts, when I'm struggling, I think about those times, you know, when somebody persevered. So good stuff. Thanks again to Mary for hanging out with us. Hey, OG, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. You know, you want to spend more time on those important questions and less time choosing your life insurance. If you've ever been through a life insurance process, you know how much a struggle it is. If you haven't, trust me, go talk to somebody who's bought traditional life insurance and they'll tell you that what you want is an application that's simple. It's online where you get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, but you still want them backed by a company that's been around for a long time. Mass Mutual, the parent company of Haven Life, been around for 160 years. Head there now to get a free quote stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. Talk about uh, an area where you where you don't want to lose, want to go right into winning. That's making a quick life insurance decision and getting on with it. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Matthew. Say hi, Matthew. Hey, Joe and OG. I'm Matt from Ohio. Go Buckeyes. I'm a big fan of the show and love what you guys do. I had a question today about short-term investments. I'm a junior in college and have relatively low expenses because I live on campus and mostly everything is paid for already. I currently have $2,000 aside for my checking account and small emergency fund. I feel like that money is just sitting there and not doing anything for me. I was wondering what the best course of action for this money is. I have a medium risk tolerance and I would like to have the money back in two years, but I could wait for three depending on how the market is. Do you think that putting that money in my brokerage account is a good idea? Or are there other investments that could be better? I'm looking forward to your advice because I'm majoring in accounting and finance, and I love learning new ideas. My t-shirt size is medium bro tank, and I won't (laughs) hold anything against you guys because you're from Michigan. Thanks again. (laughs) I like how he gets off the preemptive strike before the Buckeye love comes from RN. 
because he knew it was coming. He knew that we couldn't get away from, uh, yeah, yeah, yuck. Yuck, Matt. How could you choose that school? Yeah, I, I, I don't understand, you know, why you would go to that school either, but... Um, he seems like know, a smart whatever. guy. He seems like a really smart guy. Why would a smart well, guy... As they would say in... They'd say over in East Lansing, what, couldn't you get into Michigan State? Which is funny when hey, people from East Lansing hey, say that. Hey, stop it. How, how can you rip him at me in the same... What the hell is that about? Because you're like... Because everybody gets into Michigan State, obviously. Uh, what? Well, hey, that was the joke hey, there. Hey, I'm sitting right here. It was you and I going up against the Buckeyes, and instead you turn your attention here to beautiful East Lansing, Michigan, and the finest, Sorry. finest university in the land. I don't know what to tell you. Take it for what it is. You guys can keep Jim uh, Harbaugh. So, hey, what do we do with some cash? I got some cash sitting inside. Don't have really any expenses. What should I do with it? Robin Hood, um, <laughs> as, uh, as we've discussed, seems to be an adequate place for your fun money. Oh, boy. Now, no, I mean, listen, if you wanted to put a few bucks and start that Roth clock that everybody talks about, like, hey, I've got to get my Roth clock going, uh, yeah, sure. Take a 500 bucks and open a Roth account. Listen, here's what I would really do. I would keep all of this money liquid in cash because college is expensive and stuff's going to come up and you're going to want to go on spring break and you're going to want to do other stuff. Even if school's largely paid for, that's going to be a result of things not being paid. for. Maybe you don't want to have to start work right after you graduate in a couple of years and you want to take the summer off. That's going to need, you, you see, need some money for that. So Keep the money in cash because there's too much unknown between here and here and graduation. But keep that keep that mentality of living expenses low and keep that mentality of, you know, being frugal. Because here's the transition point. It's not about what you do with this thousand or two thousand or three thousand dollars today. What happens when you graduate from college? Well, assuming you do graduate, I mean, I don't know the graduation percentages at Ohio State. I suspect they're pretty low. What what's the what's the phrase? Something like, I didn't come here to play school, I came here to play football. Anyways, but let's assume that you do manage to get through the relatively easy finance class at Ohio State. Then uh, Joe's just choking on his coffee, but you're going to get a job. So you're going to get a Despite job. Despite the you're, fact that he has Ohio State on his resume. You're assistant manager at, you know, assistant, the Dunkin' Donuts. Assistant to the manager, not assistant manager. Assistant to the regional manager, you know, at Discount Tire, what, you know, whatever, wherever, wherever they're hiring Ohio State grads these days. By the way, nothing wrong with either one of those jobs. Of course not. Nothing wrong with and, of and not. discount tire. Ohio State discount tire, by the way, saved my ass. Yeah, uh, did. Yeah. <laughs> it totally did as we were driving around the country. So thank you to the assistant. But he wouldn't be the, the assistant manager at discount tire. He'd be the assistant, the assistant to, the to the regional manager. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just to be clear. Um, and so the temptation is when you get this high paying job, is all of a sudden you go, well, now I can get that apartment that I want all by myself, or I can finally get a car, or I can go on vacation or whatever. Keep living very frugally, add a little bit of stuff and save a boatload of cash because that trajectory, you don't know any different. When you get out of college and you're used to living on 200 bucks a week, if all of a sudden you're living on 300 bucks a week, you feel pretty good about that. That's a big pay raise. But if you start living on a thousand bucks a week, and then try to cut it back to 500 a week, you'll never be able to do it. So start that start that trajectory of higher living costs out from a lower number and, and bank the difference. And 10 years from now, you're going to have a gazillion dollars because you'll just have adapted to that better standard of living. So I keep the money in cash, but just just mentally think about it from, from the graduation standpoint. Not, I'm not saying that you're not going to graduate from Ohio State. I mean, I don't know how many people do, six or eight a year, I think. But some people will, and and probably you, sounds like. So wear your Stacking Benjamins t-shirt to class and see what they say about it. The greatest uh, agricultural school in the nation, uh, Michigan State University, will help to teach you that investments are a lot like crops. You plant them at a certain time, and you take them out at a certain time. And the second OG that he lost me on doing anything different than cash with this is when he said two to three year time frame. So- right. One thing that that you'll learn in the world of finance, especially if you end up working with clients, is anything can happen in two to three year time frame. There is a measurement that you'll want to look at called standard deviation, which will show you how much an investment can. I think the technical term is wiggle off of what that it is exactly. That's, that's it, the Ohio State term. What it usually does. 
It'll go. It'll go up and it'll go you down. Probably set. Stop bashing on Ohio State. We're gonna, <laughs> you're going to get so many emails. Maybe, maybe should. Well, especially since I have like three very close friends that went to Ohio State, unfortunately. But you got to rag them. And the retort is always, so uh, are you guys going to have a football team anytime in the next 20 years, or are you just going to get your face kicked in by us every year for 20 years? It's like, yeah. <laughs> we were on the top of the highest mountain in Vermont, and we're very close to the summit. And by the way, that sounds rough. There's a parking lot that's almost at the top. So d- d- <laughs> I'm not going to act like I hiked uh, the full 4,000 feet. We actually took our car to a point a mile and a half away and then you scramble across some rocks for about a mile and a half and you and you get there but on the way back there was a guy in a university of michigan sweatshirt and cheryl couldn't hold herself back she's like oh i can't believe they'd let michigan people up here on the mountain and he was just past us and hiking with a couple other young guys seemed like a really nice guy but his head whips around he goes he goes oh what are you guys ohio state and we go, hell, hell no, go Sparty. And he goes, and immediately, without missing a beat, he goes, oh, hey, little brother and sister, nice seeing you. He just keeps walking. Nice. It was so, it was so bad. I yelled back at him and I said, you can keep Jim Harbaugh. And then he turns around and he goes, well, you can keep D'Antonio. And you could tell it was kind of going through his head. I'm like, yeah, I'll take that deal all day long because we owned you. But anyway, for everybody who's like a Bama fan right now, we just lost them. They're gone. Or the non-sports people. We probably lost them at Mary Pallon. But back to the agriculture analogy, there's a time when you when you put an investment in the ground, and there's a time when you take it out. And if it's 10 years or longer, that's when you go into things like stock and real estate. If it's two years long, you keep it in cash. So what, what I would say, OG, is if, if he wants to take a couple dollars like you mentioned and put it in the market more to learn the mechanisms and how they work without sacrificing a lot of money so that when he does inevitably become assistant to the manager and he's rolling in the dough, he then knows how his brokerage account works. He knows some of the tools. He's made some of the mistakes, but with a smaller amount of money, I like that. By the way, I like that better than some of the games that you can play online where you use no money. I've always found that you make better decisions when you have money on the line than you do. It isn't that you make better decisions. You make, you make decisions that are, that are much more enveloped in the emotion that you're going to have. When there's no money on the line, I'll tell you, you react completely differently to these stock market games than you do when your hard earned cash is possibly going to be flushed down the toilet. Seriously, Matt, congratulations on, uh, having some money saved while you're in college. That's fantastic. Uh, Good luck with your junior year, man. And uh, Gertrude's going to send you out a code so that you can get a greatest money show on earth t-shirt. By the way, how do you get yours? And I promise as long as you didn't go to Ohio state, we won't pick on you like we did Matt. We're actually a couple of very nice guys. We'll, We'll answer your question in a very straightforward manner. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And if you do that on your phone or if your computer has a microphone on it, doesn't have to be any super high end setup, just the basic stuff that comes with your basic computer, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. All right, that's going to do it for today. Man, what a fun episode we had. Big thanks to everybody for hanging out with us today. We know that your time is probably being spent in a lot of weird ways that you haven't spent time before this last six months. And uh, we're happy that you chose to spend it with us. Big thanks also to people who took the time to leave us a review. Five stars, by the way, from Thanks Dave. Dave says, Joe's not old. At least Joe's not old enough to forget to introduce OG. I think that refers to the show a couple of weeks ago, where I think I introduced you two or three times and couldn't remember if I did or not. So <laughs> that, that has more to do, Dave, by the way. Don't with- you know better. That has more to do with riding around the country. Speaking of East Lansing, mom's uh, basement this week is in East Lansing, Michigan. So back visiting Sparty for the week. And last but not least, if you're looking for a better team in your corner, even though OG went to the University of Michigan, I wouldn't hold that against him. The good news is he has many members of his team that didn't go to the University of Michigan. So if you need their kind of help in your corner, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG. That will lead you to 
their schedule and you can see how they can interface with you to make better financial decisions in 2021. Get your plan set up here in 2020 so that you have a great 2021. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, take it from your man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Why would you use a company with no customer service? If you haven't already, it's probably time to kick Robin Hood to the curb and invest with a broker that is out to best serve you. Second, take a lesson from Mary Pillon. Often when you lose, you learn more than when you win. But the big takeaway? I just tried to call Eliza Hamilton and you know, turns out uh, she died. And, and, and believe it or not, it was all the way back in 1854. But I don't get it. I mean, she was just on Disney Plus last week. Well, that's that's kind of bad news. But people are looking into historic things from their leaders, right? Well, it turns out that I've nailed it. I'm the first person to select a dead person as my VP. Beat that Trump and Biden. Hashtag Doug 2020. Special thanks to Mary Pillon for joining us today. We will have a link to Mary's book, Losers, Dispatches from the Other Side of the Scoreboard, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. And special thanks to Dave Ramsey for dropping by the basement. Unfortunately, Dave, we weren't able to get you on the mic this episode, but hopefully soon. Stick around. historic pick today and you only heard it if you listen to the show OG. Oh, i don't know how the rules work is there any rule against having somebody who uh isn't alive i think if you are trying to win there's maybe a rule <laughs> <laughs> i think there i think there would be a rule uh did you see this thing uh going around on uh facebook somebody posted a facebook message in the group that says oh gee if you're ever to write a book i'd buy it yes and at first I thought, oh, just buy Joe's book. But then, you know, I just figured I'd go with this for a little bit. And then somebody goes, I agree, but what would the chapters be? Oh, boy. And I said, uh, if, I'll write it if you guys make the chapter titles. I'll, I'll, I'll take it from there. So I have to I have a new project. I have to <clears throat> think, of a, uh, think of a book. But here, here, here are the chapter titles that The Basement has come up with for the book that OG writes. Ready? Landing the Plane. Yes. No one can see the bags under your eyes when you wear one on your head. How to stay one step ahead of the digital nomad following you. <laughs> how to live to be 140. Uh, somebody's got a shot at the title, which is how to get educated without learning anything. So that's, that's actually pretty well said. The second midlife crisis. And it's got a picture of an airplane. <laughs> Never be 100% cash or bonds. <laughs> Buy high, sell low, and the other things I've done backwards. 
Yeah. How did I end up in a basement with a bald guy and his neighbor with a Nepalese lady and a persistent itch? <laughs> Lessons learned thanks to Steak Brother. And I think the favorite one is I don't believe in trying new things. <laughs> That's pretty good. There's like 10 of them in there. So now I've got to. It's ugly. Got to figure it out. Apparently you're getting a reputation. I do famous and infamous. I'm super <laughs> infamous. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, with the vice presidential pick, I wanted to look up uh, some of the worst vice presidential picks in history. And I think my vote goes for John C. Calhoun. Don't be knocking President Calhoun. Was he a president? I don't even know. He doesn't even sound like a president. He never became a president. Oh, boy. Oh boy. That's the that's the level of professionalism we have. Is it, was he a president? Isn't that a Kathleen Madigan like, joke? I don't know. About, hey, don't knock the United States. I like all 62 of our United States. It's great. John Calhoun first served as vice president for John Quincy Adams. Well, that's how come I recognize the name. Sounds close. Yes. Halfway is it halfway through his term. By the way, he was he was vice president for John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Pretty reliable guy then, I guess. Well, listen to this. So he first serves vice president for John Quincy Adams. Halfway through his term, he switched sides to Adams' rival Andrew Jackson, and in 1828, at the four-year mark, ran against Adams as Jackson's VP. So he's like, "Hey, I got your back." Halfway through the term, no, nah, I don't got your back. I'm gonna have the other guys back. Does that signify more of like a normal person's evolution of thought as opposed to blindly following like oh, but you whatever can't do that today of... if you're a politician, right? You're a flip flopper. If you evolve, you you, you can't evolve because if you evolve, exactly. that's what I mean. Like maybe this guy was the best vice president ever. Maybe he was. Oh, no, but 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 no, 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 so, he wasn't. OK. Oh, oh get this. But wait, there's more. So he switches sides to Andrew Jackson. And uh, Jackson wins. Betraying one president wasn't enough for Calhoun. As Andrew Jackson, by the way, this is from HistoryToday.com. As Andrew Jackson struggled to enforce the tariff of abominations in South Carolina, his vice president publicly argued South Carolina should nullify the tariff. So instead of backing up his president, he immediately says, nope, we got to get rid of this thing that my boss is working on. At stake was the viability of the federal government, and Calhoun was determined to beat Jackson. In a famous episode at a state dinner, Jackson directed a toast at his vice president turned rival. He said, our union, it must be preserved. Calhoun then got up and had a toast right afterwards. He said, the union, next to our liberty, it's the most dear. I think back in 1828 speak or 1830 speak, that was, hey, Calhoun, you. Calhoun got up and said, hey, Andy, no, you. 